That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I don't tussle with a whale. I don't handcuff lightning, throw thunder in jail. You can't stop me. I'm going to win. It ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. I won't quit. I just keep getting stronger. 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 Memes. Memes. Everyone, welcome to The Pump. We, we got a very special episode here because we've decided since the inception of this that we're just going to bring back the same people every time for the most part because we're, we're, we're lazy and we, we have a very specific type of person we like to talk to. So that's, that's Stu. Um, but Stu's bringing his partner in crime. I don't want to get – how do you – your name's not Bear, which is not what it says. You want part of me? It's Dave. Yeah, it's Dave. What's the last name? Ray. Dave Ray, which I, I wasn't sure if that was like a, a nickname. Like, you know, like, it's, it sounds like a middle name. <laughs> two first names. <laughs> like, that's why I was like, I need to ask just in case. Because, like, some people do it like that. Like, like Jeb Stewart Johnston. You got it right. You got it right. That's the first time in, like, years. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, so we brought you here to talk about you guys are basically – and I don't know how, how it works with the Bears and Arrows – and we can make some jokes about the Bears and Arrows, but essentially you're both part of Bears and Arrows, and I, I would assume powerlifting. You skill it like, yeah. You, you didn't go strength and conditioning like everyone else, or like the, the power group or some shit. It was I'm powerlifting. Fucking, I'm not gonna dress it up. <laughs> strength and conditioning is a lot more fucking complicated, and I'm not that smart. Like, listen, we're powerlifters, but yeah. So, so we brought you here to kind of talk about that, and we'll kind of talk some shit about business and. and and the military and all that stuff. But I, I think, um, Stu, we don't need to introduce you again. Basically, he's, I don't you, Actually, you know what? Fuck it. You got to introduce yourself again because the first time you did it, it was like really shitty. And then we'll, we'll, get, we'll go to Dave. So, so, Stu, for anyone who hasn't listened to Stu, Stu, kind of way quicker version, like 20 seconds. Okay. So, my name's Stuart Locke. I am the co-founder of Kodiak Barbell alongside David Ray. I am also the director of strength, sports, and education um, for Prescript. That's it. That, that's that's fucking Ooh. good, Jeb. That was good. That was solid. That was like I'm elevator pitch one on one. So before we go to Dave, so I screwed up. Is it? It's Kodiak Barbell. Like this is where. So Dave's gonna. Dave's gonna. We'll explain it. Yeah, just Dave's gonna down. explain this. So Dave, you can talk as long as you want. Stu just like talked for like ten minutes last time about all the stuff. So you can you can do whatever this time. So introduce. You can t- tell us the, the whole the whole thing here. What is Dave? Okay, doing? so. Just to bring everyone up to speed, so we have Bears and Arrows, which is kind of like the athlete um, apparel. We host and sponsor events uh, for powerlifting, hopefully bridging the gap over into strongman events. And then as that developed and grew over the past three years, um, I've been coached by Stu pretty much since I first started powerlifting. So that relationship kind of developed to where we are now, where it's like, okay, Bears and Arrows is at a spot. It does its own fucking thing. Um, and we need to branch out into the training side of things. So we brought on Stu as like the first coach into Kodiak Barbell. Um, I was just messing around, like building up a website, how to present it to people and essentially wanted Stu to have his own platform that he can gain clients on, gain traction on, have a social media presence on, uh, and take it from there. Um, so that pretty much was the concept for starting Kodiak Barbell that pretty much ties under the umbrella of bears and arrows um and then since then i think we started it maybe like six weeks ago and we're now we have a team built um you know we have a crossfit guy olympic lifting specialist kind of coach guy uh nutrition we have another powerlifting coach uh and then Stu is kind of the i would say lead trainer organizer of handling um the client side for strength and conditioning and then i'll just i just run and slang t-shirts and talk shit what what's what, what's it about Stu? this is what i don't get like this bald dude that like talks very vulgar on instagram all of a sudden just gets handed all this powerlifting shit like prescript is like oh like Stu, what did you do like who's i, I don't want to say who i'm not going to use a sexual innuendo but you know what i mean yeah <laughs> um honestly i think it's just because um <clears throat> you don't have to add to this um, either yeah like <laughs> this I, I totally kept my fucking mouth shut for a really long time and i just like sat in a room with people much smarter than me and i absorbed as much as i could off of them um and then like i've always wanted 
as bad as it sounds to say, like I've always wanted to make money and I like making money and money makes my life much easier. Um, and my dad has been my business mentor from the beginning. So he was like, listen, like he's always been in my ear. He's like, you have this ability to talk to people. You have this ability to like foster and create these relationships and you have all this knowledge and training fucking do something man like you can't just be slinging year packs of good life for the rest of your life and I was like okay and then COVID started and uh wasn't working there anymore and so here we are man that that's like the dad's dad's every dream is like their son's gonna sell gym memberships I, I think we kind of gloss over an important point here is that like <clears throat> The, what's what's the crux of this is like being able to like communicate and, and and foster relationships right so many people miss that part they're like hey i know all this shit why am i not making money it's like well because you're a fucking asshole people have to be able to fucking like you man like so much of that is lost and because like so a big thing um that i learned from my parents like they were business owners from the time i was born and uh they were in the hospitality industry right they owned a hotel and so a big thing like from the time that i was like four or five, like when they'd introduce me to someone, I'd tell them my name, they'd make me shake their hand. And that was a big thing for me yeah. moving forward. And like, and also like developing emotional intelligence, I think goes a long way in terms of coaching people. And that's something that a lot of people fucking forget. It's like, you coach the person, you're not coaching a program. The person does the program, you coach them. And, um, you know, if you can't get them to like operate at 100% efficiency in the program, like you have to figure out, you know, using either vinegar or honey, like how to get them there. And people focus so much like in, you know, like Dean, you went that down that rabbit hole with like the whole PRI bullshit yeah. and stuff. And it's like, you get so obsessed with the science of it. And you forget that at the end of the day, there's still the personal part of personal training. Well, I think that's a lot, like a large portion of, this is why it's kind of funny because we're going to bring on t like a bearded dude with camo and a bald dude with camo and we're talking about emotional intelligence, which is like, but like that's, <laughs> that's, it seems, I don't want to say it's been lost, but I think that there is this growth in, we, we kind of trash this for all time. Everyone can get into it, but there is this growth of, of strong individuals that we, we would say there's a mix of old school, but are kind of adapting to the new school. Cause I would say that emotional intelligence before was something that you either had or you didn't, where now I think people are starting to understand you could build that and inter you should be interjecting into your businesses because then they'll be successful. They'll be more successful. Cause it's, it, like you said, it's not just overnight. Like it's, it, it took a while to do that. Like you don't just build Kodiak barbell in six weeks and it becomes successful because you didn't do anything before that. You know what I mean? That's why I brought up the fact that you got brought in, but um, it's one of those things where it's not an overnight success. I don't know. That well, I think this is a good segue. Then, like Dave, like how would you say that your experience in the military prepared you for the experiences now with, with running a business and in, in, in a, a coaching environment? Yeah. And maybe we just to add to that, like maybe that's where we start talking about your infancy into this. And cause I would assume that that, that segues also into you creating your company. Oh, I might time. be reading into that, but. Um, there's a lot of like, so sounds weird to say, like to talk about yourself. Um, coming from the military, like I enlisted when I was 17 years old in the reserves in Barrie, Ontario. Um, and then before I knew it, I still had no direction other than like my entire life. I was like, I'm going to join the military. Here's what I want to do get everything else out of the way until I can finally enlist, did it, join the reserves, get my feet, uh, get my foot in the door with that. And then fast forward about two years in, um, I found myself on special forces selection. Um, that one of my Sergeant majors at the old company was like, Hey, you should check this out. If you want to do this, that, and the other thing within the military, um, uh, CSOR at the time started in 2006. Um, so it was a fairly, fairly new regiment, um, that kind of started during the, uh, the initial height of the, uh, the Afghan war, uh, with Op Medusa starting in 2006. Um, so this unit that was kind of, I guess you can say born from war, uh, drawing its lineage back to the first special service force, uh, which was USA and Canada. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> 
just to come back to it with all the history that was going on there, something that I always wanted to do. And then the special operations allowed me to facilitate that. So I tried out drowned in the fucking pool. The first time I went on selection, <laughs> fucking didn't pick it up, didn't make it that year. Um, but what it did give me was a huge insight. I was like, Holy fuck. Like this is what I need to do. Um, came back the next year, did another hell week, finally got selected to go on course, started course in 2009 and graduated as a badged operator in 2010. Um, and then that's pretty much where I've been for the last eight years. Um, so now that I've semi retired from the unit, um, I do take instructor contracts to go back and help run different training events uh, throughout the year with the unit still, but it's just kind of on my, on my own terms type thing. And so I needed something to do post-military. And uh, I kind of got the business incentive from another friend who I've, I've served with, who uh, later on went to the JTF and then released entirely from the unit. And uh, he now runs a very successful olive oil company within Ottawa uh, called Aurelius Food Co. So he was kind of picking my brain, talking about his direction. He's like, listen, man, like I'm doing this. And never before would I ever see myself in any sort of business capacity at all. Um, you know, years ago, if I said, you know, in the next five years, where are you going to be? It definitely wouldn't be like, you know, I'm going to put on this singlet, smell this ammonia and start powerlifting and have this little company to go along with it. Right. <laughs> um, but it all ties into like being within the SF community. Uh, strength was always something that we were constantly working towards like having a high physical standard was something to always have on the table and uh so i was like okay well that is pretty much my interest outside of the military um so on my third deployment i was in iraq at the time uh i started to fuck around with that idea a bit more of like okay pick pick an interest and let's see what I can develop on that. So I started learning, okay, I need a website. So I hopped on a couple of those free 30 day trial things and started to plug and play with a layout. Um, so kind of got off the ground. I was like, okay, well, what's the easiest thing to do? T-shirts, everyone needs to wear a fucking shirt. Um, so I was like, okay, T-shirts kind of gets my foot in the door within the fitness industry, if that's what I'm gonna try to do. You know, I enjoy the process of training. I love training. I like having a high physical standard for myself. I was like, okay, we'll do the t-shirt thing. And uh, it just grew from there. Uh, before I knew it, I was learning how to use um, Adobe Illustrator to start designing, um, doing That's layouts on t-shirts. Like, are you doing this all overseas? Yeah, or just in some spare time that I had, I'd just fuck around on my little shitty laptop that That's I had. Awesome. Um, so, and it kind of, it kind of shows within our designs of like, it's fucking simple. Yeah. Like it says support local strength in like basic fucking font. I just, <laughs> I just see you in like a tent on this like little shitty, like trying to connect to the fucking satellite. And you're like, <laughs> you're like drawing like a little bear. <laughs> <laughs> but in the, in the main camp, it was good to go. Like we had, uh, we had, we had decent Wi-Fi, like everyone's attached to the same network. So it was pretty fucking, uh, pretty slow going, but nonetheless workable. Um, so yeah, like that's pretty much how it got started. And then the more and more I was talking to uh, Mike, the owner of Aurelius, um, he was kind of my guide through this whole thing of like, you know, there is more post-military, like there is other things things you can do if you have an interest you can per pursue that as a business um so as over the the next three years so this was in 2017 with the i guess the official launch um i wasn't even competing in powerlifting at the time like i kind of really had no idea about the whole world of strength sports like i, I knew about it knew about strongman knew about powerlifting i uh, was doing the whole crossfit thing because i had the best tie over to your physical performance in, you know, uh, special operations. Um, so bringing all these things in together, I still really didn't have a direction at that point. So I was like, okay, well, you want to do everything. So I was like, you know, trying to appeal to a CrossFit powerlifting strongman, whatever. 
Uh, but then once I actually competed in September of 2017 at my first powerlifting meet, it was a total shit show. I didn't even know you had to wear a singlet. Like I, I showed up in like gym clothes and I'm like, fucking let's go, right? <laughs> And uh, Brady, who was running the EPC at the time, was like, man, did you even read the rule book? I'm like, no. <laughs> no it's, fucking, it's just lifting weights. This is just stupid. Who, who made that rule? Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you're fucking squat bench and dead, right? Like, let's go. And uh, so it, it opened my eyes. So I was like, holy shit, like, this is an actual official thing. Like, I'm sitting here at, like, a, an athlete's meeting. Um, that was quotation marks for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, like I'm in a room full of obese guys <laughs> eating donuts. Did you pull? Oh, did you man. pull the listen, bud? I've been in Iraq. I ain't wearing no singlet. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, you're pretty fucking gay, but whatever. Um, yeah. So, so that was like my first exposure to it. So I got hooked up with a hand-me-down singlet, and I was like, oh, fuck, this is like kind of embarrassing. And I told my friends to come out to this thing too. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> but it, it was really good like um the kind of environment that was created uh around this event and like kind of like seeing all the hype seeing all the different athletes it was actually the first time i saw paul O'Need um yeah. coaching his athletes there and i was like who the fuck is this guy um <laughs> and uh he actually doesn't look that strong no. Like, we'll both, I think we can all To be fair, he's pretty jacked now, but at the time, he didn't look that When I met him in person, so, like, I, I've known Paul for a long time, and then when I met him in person, like, you're so, like, how are you 240? Like, he's just, like, he's not wide on either direction. His legs are, like, it, it's just interesting. Like, he's super strong, so you're like, well, fuck, I don't, that doesn't matter, but. He looks he huge looks... now, and he's, like, I think he told me he was 224, and I was like, dude, you look like you're 250 and, like, abs. Yeah. I'm like, all right, you got it down, man. Good to go. <laughs> yeah. And he's he's a good coach, though. He's super, like, th that's what I mean. Like, he's soft-spoken. He's super, like, yeah. Well, yeah. It works for him because it's like uh, you are saying before, that emotional intelligence and that um, the relationship goes beyond, you know, anyone can make a spreadsheet and do, yeah, do a five-by-five. Five, here you go. Oh, you're fucked up. Okay, take a week off. Um Paul's approach, much like Stu's approach, is for the individual, and there's a lot more invested interest rather than you can coach anyone for a buck twenty a month and just take their cash and send them an email. Um, but the difference of having a good coach is like Stu and Paul, where it's like, no, 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 I need you to succeed. I want you to succeed. You know, the financials later, but it's like, no, we need to make a program. You need to get coached for your best. Oh, I, th I think what gets lost and Jeb will kind of back this up too. Cause he he's been in some sports, but like, I think there's a lack of model. Like this is the problem with like powerlifting. I think is like people get into powerlifting and they don't really see that coaching relationship. Like if you're in the military, you, like you kind of have a model, like you have a, you have the person above you and you kind of have to listen. You see their coaching, blah, 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 blah. Football, same thing. It's like, we had models of coaches to understand how coaching is supposed to get done. Paul was in strength and conditioning at like universities at the university level. Like he's seen, that process i don't think there's enough true face-to-face -face time with people in front of us at least in the powerlifting world where they've seen had that coaching that's why i think athletes do so well or ex-athletes do so well at coaching and i don't know jeb like with bjj like same shit like, you, you yeah, know I mean, how to I coach played because i played football growing up I, you know now i do bjj and wrestle and um you know box mma there's a hierarchy and I think that uh, nowadays too, and not to, you know, be the fucking old curmudgeon or whatever, but I think everyone's so afraid of hierarchical structures. They're like, no, no one can be the, you know, in charge and we don't want to put someone higher than someone else. And I was like, that's a huge benefit though. And, and what's so nice about BJJ is it's, it's very clear. And I said it in the last podcast, when someone puts their balls in your face and sits on you and then chokes you, you know who's in charge like it's there's no question whereas now it's like oh but but you know if someone's better than you it's like cool that person's better than me let me just go learn from them instead of being pissed you see that in the powerlifting world like i i brought up Stu before because like you're getting people are just like handing you opportunities but it's not like that it's like with paul you walk into the fucking room and you know you know who the dude is like it, like you don't even have to be lifting to like know who the, the the real coaches are i don't know in my opinion i can pick them out within like 
five minutes sure. of being at a place. Yeah, you can tell based on the way that they interact with other people yeah. um, because they carry themselves in a certain way. And like, <clears throat> like so much of it is like, and I hate to rag on like, you know, the USAPL or the CPU or whatever, but like you have these fucking egghead coaches who've never done anything other than coach powerlifters and they're really good at updating Excel and then yeah. they don't understand how to coach technique because they themselves have never been strong and they've made this, you know, six to $8,000 a month business. And you're like, Jesus fucking Christ, dude. Like at some point you have to think about like raising the standard. And at some point it's like, it's not about getting better at Excel. So little of it is about fucking getting better at Excel. And it's just like, they're obsessed. They're like, well, maybe if I track like, you know, microcycle tonnage versus mesocycle tonnage, it's like, you're looking at the wrong thing here. Like, you don't know how to speak to someone and like fucking maintain eye contact. That's a bigger fucking problem than micro versus mesocycle tonnage tracking. <laughs> or like, look at like Eddie Cohen's like training, right? He was like, you know, I, I worked, I did the same things over and over again. I built up, took a little break, built up. He's like, but I built up slowly. He didn't sit there and analyze percentages Man, or. He straight up said he didn't. He was like, yeah. dude, I did, like, didn't really have a plan. Like, I think the one video he was like, he had a plan of the stuff he's going to do. He's like, I didn't know what weights I was doing. He's like, we fucking just did it. <laughs> Which I do like. I do, like, I always say, I get the idea of. Because the other argument on the CPU side is like the percentages matter or at the meet, like those little minute changes matter. But it's like, that's like the micro details after you fucking nut up. Yeah. After you've gotten yeah. strong. <laughs> when, you, when you're 105 pounds or whatever, and you're like, Hey, I got a three and a half times body weight deadlift. It's like, yeah, that's still fucking shit. <laughs> That's still well, I don't know, and like Dave, maybe, Dave would be a good example because we just we just talked about your intro into it. But like, what did you see when you went into that? Because like, that's what I mean. Like, you 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 mentioned Paul, but Paul is an easy person to stand out in a crowd amongst. Like, you, you talk about like the the subtleties of powerlifting and how they're a little weird and like. But I don't know. In general, I think it's yeah. Um, like he was coaching his clients there, and he was like extremely like he was like on them. He's like, Hey, you need to warm up now. You need to do this. So what I saw from that, even coming from the military, it's like, okay, that dude switched on. Like he's has his dudes on like a plan of what they need to accomplish and for what they want to do. Um, but then I also saw like the other side of it where I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? Cause I'm like, man, we're literally at a fucking like a YMCA banquet hall here. Like, and you're walking around like, you know, there's a scout in the crowd. You're going to get this sponsor, whatever, whatever. I was like, you know, just do what you need to do. You don't need to come across like a total fucking shithead because at the end of the day, it's like everyone is here for their, their own thing. Like, you know, if this guy just wants to bench press over 300 pounds for the first time, then boom, all the power to him. Good to go. Um, but that, that attitude that I was exposed to with like, there's like two, I saw two categories. There's the people there that like had an interest in doing it and they just wanted to do it for fun because essentially what it comes down to, powerlifting is a fun fucking sport. Like everyone pays to fucking, like pays their registration fee, pays their membership fee, and they have to get themselves to this event. Um, but then the other side of it was like these guys show up and they got the attitude, they got this ego, they got to carry themselves like fucking look out on the biggest one in the fucking room. And much like the guy I was talking about with like boxing and fucking jujitsu, I was like, this is not the UFC. Like you can squat 700 pounds, but I guarantee you, you'll get knocked the fuck out just as quick. And there's, there's a lot of that shit going around. And I've never been one to have this crazy attitude like this crazy ego of like get the fuck out of my way i'm a power lifter this that and the other thing because at the end of the day i was like we're not we're not fighting here you know what i mean like yeah. this is for your yourself you need to be focused on more than just having this persona or this concept of yourself it's like everyone is there to have a fucking good time and it is what it is um, but it'd, it'd be different if I were, first exposure to it <laughs> but like it's it's like we can all see the writing on the wall if when you get into powerlifting it's it's a good sport example because i don't think anytime soon anyone's going to be making any real money so like it has to be considered a hobby and like 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 the military is a good example because like if you, you, you don't perform like you could potentially die i don't think football is even a good example but 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 Stu and i talked about football it's like well powerlifting is literally i can't even compare it on the same scale 
<laughs> because in football you get hit in the face every day. Like I've, I've got, I bit through my lip. Like that, I've had a bigger injury just fighting through my lip than most powerlifters will ever experience. And this is like, well, and you clearly have a lot of CTE as well. So, well, but but that's what I mean. Like it, it's like, well, like even even lifting, lifting is not really that hard. And but it, it doesn't mean I just don't get the ego involved. With the, like there was actually a good post. Um, he's a strong man out of Alberta. His name is like Monster Mo. But he, he was he's like a pretty like bigger strong man. Anyways, long story short, he was he was like, I don't get what the fuck's going on with these sports nowadays, like a powerlifting and strongman, because they used to be about the show. People would go in because they know it's a show of strength because there's no fucking money. There's no eagles to be had. You just kinda go in, light it up, be the dude for the day, but it's just like now it's become metrics and like people have these like egos and attitudes about I'm the best crew and stuff. It's like, listen, dude, your crew doesn't think it, it's so irrelevant. Like, why can't you just, I don't know. I, and maybe that's like the elitist attitude. I don't know. I don't know. I've yeah. been out of strongman for a while, but it was always pretty chill. I mean, yeah. like, the super heavies were kind of sometimes dicks, but they were actually trying to get to the main stage. So I, that made sense to me. Like they That's were the, different. But that's what I mean. Like they're trying to, like, at least with strongman, there's like this hierarchy with powerlifting. The main stage for where most people are at is fucking so far above where, where like the one or two powerlifters per province are at. Like Stu's one of the strongest guys, and he, you're still not that strong, like comparatively. And you, you'd say no. the same thing. Like, and it's uh, like Dave and I had a good conversation a couple of weeks ago, which is like people tie so much of their ego into their performance when it comes to any of this shit, right? And like they define themselves by it. And it's like, how fucking lame is it that you're going to define yourself as like? a power lifter and how much you fucking squat bench press and deadlift as opposed to like who you are as a person and like your relationships with those around you and like the other actual important shit that you've accomplished in your fucking life. Cause at the end of the day, like even if your mom says that she cares, no one cares about your power lifting. Nobody cares. Yeah. And it's like, Jesus. Especially when the numbers are there, dude, like, like I was saying, like I was half decent when I was at like, at like a 1700 total like it's so far fucking gone like the numbers are literally outlined most most people can't even reach like the top like there's 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 no way in in hell they well, can dude, even be can there at least like with football it's like we're one step below pro like if you do good or have a good season like it could happen with power it's like it's never happening like you get different parents that's how it happens yeah <laughs> Like it's never happening. So, like, drop the ego. Like, and same thing with strongman. The strongman, at least, like, back in the day, like there was there was only like two levels really, and you knew that the dudes who knew that they had a shot knew. Now it's like everyone in powerlifting thinks that they have a shot, and I'm like, listen, yeah. the strongest dude in my city doesn't even have a shot, and he's like I mean, super strong. Well, that, like I said, like I would go to the gym, and like I remember the first time Oak was training in there, and he was hurt. And you could like literally just hear weight. I was just like, what's happening back there? This fucking dude squatting. I'm like, how can I feel like I physically hear this kind of weight being squatted? <laughs> you walk back and you're like, oh, that's why. This guy's fucking, you know, and this was his form. I remember his form was terrible. And he's like repping out 660 on, on squats. And this was years ago. And then now you just look at the guy. I mean, it's just the, the way numbers have gone. It's just insane. Well, dude, like, Dean, you competed at, what, 198? Yeah. Did you see John Hack? He competes at 198. He just benched 550. So, John, just John, is, John is basically when I stopped caring about powerlifting. I went to the extra. You're like, I'm done. I, like, I was like, oh, yeah, I got my elite total fucking. He was, he was my roommate for, like, I want to say, like, three days. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'm just here to watch and blah, blah, blah. He was like, I want to say he was, like, 19 or 20. He's like, I'm going to go to the elite FTS compound um, and just, like, squat. They invited me out. And he was like, yeah, like, I did, like, 680 raw with no wraps. And he was, like, literally eating pizza and chugging juice. And he's, like, rail thin. And I was like, what? I was like, fuck this. I'm done. And he was, he, so he, that was, like, the infancy of, like, everything just squirted, like, through the roof. Like, it went through the roof. Um, use whatever sexual innuendo you want. Sport it through the roof. Um, but I knew I was done. I was like, dude, like, this kid is like, he's he's not even the best. Well, I guess he is the best. He was the best. But yeah, 500 pounds. Like, doesn't even look like a powerlifter. Like, he kind of is looking more like a powerlifter now. But even still, he's fucking 198 pounds, and he's benching more than the people two weight classes above him. Yeah, he was like, I was, I benched 460 or whatever. I was like, what? Wow, you don't even, you haven't even lifted for like three years. 
but I felt better. So like, this is where I, you know, I'm, I was like, well, I played, like he, he couldn't, he sucked at football. So I was like, see these yeah, people, you. like, <laughs> he's like, I tried to be a safety. I'm like, yeah, fuck, you suck. <laughs> but like, there is that thing. It's, it's, it's like, John, but John, John didn't even know, didn't even care about powerlifting really that much. Like he was so nonchalant about it. I'm like, that's the guy, like, he doesn't even know he's in like the top fucking four. Like and maybe he does, but everyone else who has an ego around it, you're not that dude. Like you're not even close to that guy. So what's the point of walking around this meat? Like you have, like, you're the fucking big head honcho. Like you suck at everything, but like you're average, you're above average at powerlifting. That yeah. that has no place. And I think that there's more of that now than there was when it was even considered. Now it's not even considered a hobby sport, even though it is. But when it was considered a hobby sport, it was way cooler. Yeah, but the guy and the guy who's got the big ego walking around, there's some girl that just started powerlifting six months ago, weighs, you know, 115 pounds and is making six figures on Instagram because she decided to start incorporating it into her life. You know, <laughs> so like, who's the successful one? There? There, there's actually, uh, there's actually a person in our city that is like that. Yeah. Fuck. Good. Good for her. Like, fuck. I hear stuff like that and I get so fucking fired up because I'm like, you know what? You found a niche in the market and you co-opted that and now you are set financially good for yeah. you well that's that's making it in powerlifting sorry <laughs> like at least with at least with kodiak barbell and bears and arrows at least you like have like a whole structure like it's like a company company but like it's like sometimes you, you i don't know you you're not gonna be able to compete with the hot chicks on instagram so you got to kind of carve your own path Me or, or you too. sponsor them <laughs> Not they both, might be both, able to, both you. to get a, <laughs> it's honestly way harder to be you two to be honest like actually <laughs> power and like, like like representative of the sport with tattoos and like it did like you you guys actually like represent kind of the top tier of it and it's way harder for you guys to actually try to be good at it because it's not a real sport sorry <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, if it was the NFL, it'd be like, yeah, like, the best fucking make money. It's not how it works right now. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, there's no really correlation between income and, and skill. No, none. Yeah. Which is a weird fucking thing. <laughs> Which is why I, like, wanted to bring you guys on, because essentially, there, it can happen. Like, you yes, can do 100%. good work. And, and still create a business from the ground up. It's just, I don't know, like in your experience, I guess, where's your heads on with that? Because you are trying to do it, we'll call it the right way. Yeah. So, I mean, like you know, Dave can speak to this after, but essentially like our idea um, and his idea, well, this is his idea to start with is like his idea with Bears and Arrows is like, if we can have, so it's, it's all, it's all, it all starts with quality. Quality is like the, the, the prime thing above all else is like the shirts that you know we use with bears and arrows you know they're a much more expensive shirt like all of the stuff that we do is all hand done like all of this shit is like all quality and the reason for that is is like when someone gets a bears and arrow shirt and they feel it and it's in their hands and they put it on they're like this is a fucking nice shirt like in the person that put this shirt together legitimately cares about like the quality and the aesthetic of the company, right? They want things to look and be seen as a certain way. And so because of that, and, and you know, I'm sure Dave will attest to this, a lot of repeat customers, mm -hmm. you know, there's fucking, you know, there's like 50, 75 people that buy everything that Bears and Arrows makes. And when I was talking to Dave about when we started Kodiak Barbell, it was like, my idea was the same thing, right? It's like, I don't want to have, you know, 350 people by, you know, a month of coaching one time. I want to have like 60 people sign on for coaching. And then those people are with me for however long they decide to compete in powerlifting. Because that shows that I'm doing the right thing and I'm positing quality above all else. And that's the thing that's really lost in a lot of these like Insta fit models is like, they'll put out, you know, this fucking project beach body booty building bullshit. But because the quality's not there, you're going to get a lot of one-time customers. You're not going to get any repeat customers. But the ultimate reality is if you want to make a fucking career out of this, you need to get repeat customers and you need to have quality. Dave. Yeah. Um, oh, my shirts suck. 
<laughs> it's actually not. I don't even make. Videos, so. Well, and that, and I think a lot of that stems from my uh, experience within the military. Like a lot of small team kind of tactics, small team deployments, where you can accomplish so much with a smaller team of good to go individuals rather than having you know a hundred in your back pocket. Um, so we apply the same principle to we want the quality and our i guess like our customer engagement our community engagement is also a, a big um let's say like that positive reinforcement that we instill on the people that come to bears and then they give right back to us in support um you know we don't take those things lightly or take them for granted which is why we have like that base of 50 to 60 to 70 people that are so consistent with us because that that relationship is developed and uh, I would rather have a smaller consistent group of good to go people rather than just get that exposure um, from like a business standpoint of like exposure exposure get it out there get it out there pump it out pump it out reach as many people as possible you know make a thousand sales good to go whatever um, which also shows in our growth like we've never really run sponsored ads because I want people to organically find us so that we can actually have that interaction with them. If they ask us questions or if we see them at meets and then they're like, Oh, I heard about you from so-and-so on social media. And now we're face to face. Like I, those are the relationships that we kind of want to develop uh, and have and, and maintain. Um, so growth is um, smaller consistently um, which is why it's taken us three years to kind of get to this point. Uh, but it's in my eyes, it's worth it just to have that, that firm foundation of like, you know, we're quality first, we'll engage with everyone whoever comes our way. And then that also ties into the Kodiak barbell thing. Like we have a well-educated group of guys who are not just in it to get those 400 clients a month. Like the clients that they do have, they're fully engaged with. And, uh, I think I relate to Stu on this uh, with his experience from coming from a football team. Like he has those 20 guys that he needs to rely on that they're, he's invested in and they're invested in him uh, from a team aspect. And then, you know, it, it's directly relatable to coming from the SF community where it's small team, you need to be reliable, dependable and good to go. So if we can bridge that over onto the business side of things, then uh, I'd rather take that route than just get the, uh, quick bills paid you know yeah well, i think that's an interesting corollary to like sf too is like this idea that um you guys all operate as a small team but every single person has to be completely autonomous and be able to take on these other roles and like taking that into business like knowing that that the people you work with like you said are completely reliable you don't have to waste time or energy worrying about what the fuck they're doing you just got to do your thing and you know that they're taken care of. And I think that's a huge corollary. Yeah. And that, that's what we've tried to instill right from the very beginning. Like, um, like when I was running the web page, like I, I have another interest that I found through doing this is photography. So it's like, okay, I'll make, I'll do my same energy will be into the photography, creating the structure and system. So that Stu only needs to worry about coaching his clients and ensuring their success. So that Talison and Nick and Steve can do what they want to do. Like they just want to function as coaches and instill the best in their clients that they're doing. Um, so kind of my end through Kodiak, although I do coaching myself uh, for military fitness, but more so my focus is ensuring that they get these connections. The traffic is driven to them so that they can focus on what they want to do, which is coaching and making sure. That Are you, are you the one taking the pictures of Stu with his shirt off and he's like, he's putting on his Instagram? No, that's him on a self timer. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, the, is, you actually use a self timer, dude. I thought the trick is to do a video and just take stills. Yeah. He <laughs> yeah, didn't like the quality of those ones. He totally just didn't know that. I, okay. I actually, I, I, we talk about SF and stuff. So, we talked about Kodiak Barbell. Let's talk about like the, the infancy. I think I'm, I think Jeb and I are both interested in, and Stu kind of talked about this before, but like with the military people, what have you kind of, cause we w I would assume that that's kind of what you specialize in on the main business I was in the training stuff. Is, is that the case? Like you get a lot of like ex-military people. 
who want something? Uh, no. No? As far as, um, like, the traction for myself with doing these, uh, like, either SF selection preps mm-hmm. and uh, or just military fitness for people that are either currently serving yeah. or they want to, there's a lot of fucking tire kickers that are yeah. like, oh, man, military, like, I don't know if they just like the photo or they like multicam and shit. Um but they usually come around and they're like, oh man, like, yeah, I want to be, uh, I want to join the SF. And I was like, okay, like what unit are you with now? And they're like, well, I haven't enlisted yet. And I'm like, well, fuck man. Like, you know, spend a week outside <laughs> getting yelled at in the mud and then see if you even like the military in the first place. Um, so there's been, a, there's been a lot of that, but the guys that actually do come on and are like, fuck it, I'm doing this. Let's get the program rolling. Like, it's good to go and they have an extreme interest in it first even if they're not military they just have that drive where let's try it out let's get fit um and a good marker for me to kind of get to know the individual who wants these programs is pretty much like how excited they are to get started like even if they're not in the military yet but they're like holy shit i want to do this i want to get prepared for this job before going into it and to me that's a huge marker for success with these guys going into the military where it's like, okay, this job that you want to do is more than a job because you're putting your own time like ahead of, you know, even enlisting and getting exposed to the job first, you know what you want to do. You have that goal orientation of joining the military and you're setting yourself up for success by, you know, getting trained, like doing some military fitness, doing some, um, you know, cross training style and all that kind of stuff. What, is, what does that look like? I think like if anyone's listening, that's jumping into this and they're like, dude, I want to like do that. Like I want to drown in the pool, which side note, <laughs> um, there was like a podcast with Joe Rogan and David Blaine. He was talking about how like he trained to like be underwater for whatever fucking him and it's, but like, it's kind of normal to pass out. And when you come back to you're like, it's like you're on mushrooms. I don't know if that happened to you, but. Uh, no, um, I was, I always thought of myself as like, oh, you know what? I'm a strong swimmer. I'm good to go. Um, and then at the time, like whatever, 11 or 12 years ago now, we never had the exposure to it like we do now. Like I had no idea that there was online coaching way back when. I had no idea like how to read a training program. Like I grew up boxing and playing hockey and my parents both lifted like i pretty much went to daycare at the same gym I ended up training in 20 years later. Um, so it was always like I had the, uh, the muscular development magazines that I would read while I'm walking on the treadmill getting warmed up. And I was like, Oh, fucking, you know, four sets of eight incline press. That's what I'm going to do today. Yeah. And like there, there wasn't like the huge knowledge base that um, was readily available at the time. So I feel like I had no idea what I was doing until I got there. So I'm like, oh yeah, okay. I had no idea that there was going to be um, any sort of water attribute involved. And I was like, oh fuck, okay, well there's water. Here we fucking go and, and got amongst it, right? And whatever happened, happened. Uh, and then <laughs> the following year, I was like, okay, fucking, that was a bit more you know, I need a, I need a higher expectation of myself going into this. So then CrossFit became a big thing. Like they finally, I guess, had a website. Um, so I started doing the CrossFit workouts that was just, you know, just random posts of stuff. And, uh, it seemed to work and I was still kind of trying to do the bro split where I'm like, yeah, I still want to bench press, you know? Um, but as far as doing that cross training style of stuff and then just basic implementations of what you would do in the military like put some weight in a backpack and go distance for time like and and you don't need to be in the military to understand like the athletic output you'd be you you like the cardiovascular capacity that you'd be building doing that um so it's just shit simple things and just try to mimic what you would what you would think or what you would be doing in the military Um, And a lot of that's like weighted runs. So doing Murph is a great, um, is a great workout to do uh, if you're solely focused on doing a a military fitness type um, programming, things like that, implementing like uh, ruck marches throughout the week, like try to build, 
you know, uh, a max distance like week. So do 80 kilometers by the end of the week. You have five days to do 80 clicks, get it in however you get it in. Um, you know, in, start implementing like more weight, shorter distance, try to run it. If that doesn't work, go the other way. Still put the weight in the bag, but try to go for distance and pace yourself. Um, set up your own markers for success while still applying the, the basic foundations of what you would expect from the military. What I noticed though, we had Tony Cowden on the power rack strength team when I was on it. But anyway, long story short is it, it actually mimicked a lot of either hybrid training or like kind of strongman in the way that they do like um, event days. It's like your event practices are like the, would be the, the military, but based on the way you said it would be like the military challenges that you would do. Cause it, you know what I mean? Like it would, and you would kind of fit that in logistically. Like you don't just be stupid about it. But yeah. I think that that's where like, it's interesting to hear your thoughts on it in terms of how you would kind of situate stuff. Cause I think a lot of people are, they might not hire a coach. Cause it's, I don't know. It's well, I say there's still people who don't know about online coaching and they're still reading magazines, dude. Like, I don't think that that's too far gone yet. Well, that that's, that could either be a good thing or a bad thing because there, for as much great information there is readily available now, there's just as much shit information going, right? So it's kind of hard. I would say it's more harder to navigate through the bullshit now to figure out what works. So I would always recommend anyone to research a coach. So if someone was to look up Stu, they can check his credentials. They can read his bio and see if he's a good fit. And then furthermore into that, they can always ask who he's currently training right now, or even ask Stu like, Hey, how's your client success? What do you, what, what are your expectations as a client for doing all these things? So um, at that point, you're just kind of navigating through all the shit. How many meets uh, have you done in the last three years? That was how many <laughs> <band> or Stu? <laughs> how many, how many season ending injuries have you had? <laughs> Three. I've had three season and injuries and one meet. I feel like that's actually a good question because it's like <laughs> you're still kicking. Like you know, you know what not to do. Yeah, don't <laughs> fracture all the vertebrae in your back and then squat anyways in the meet. <laughs> that's just a suggestion. I, I was like, well, there's a belt for a fucking reason. Yeah, so come on. so it, 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 you're right. That's his first thought. It's just a suggestion. And then he realized, no, it's not. <laughs> Stu was that guy walking around the meat. You're like, look at this asshole. Like, like <laughs> your quad's going to blow up. No, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. It's just a flesh wound. I'm like the fucking, the, the guy from Holy Grail. Just gonna See, rub some icy hot on it. You're good. With, with your injury, so with your quad injury, actually, this is fun, like, it's not funny, but like we, there's a few people in the powerlifting world that have just like, I don't even think that they knew there was an injury and that just pop. And those yeah. are like the really fucked up squat fails. Like, a, yeah, Mark Bell has one. Who did Oak have one? No, no, Oak had the one where he threw the bar over his head. Yeah, in the meat with like 700 pounds. Lily, ha good. Lily popped both of his patellas. Lily popped. Yes. Yeah. So with yours, it was your fault. Like you fucking knew right? Kind of. Okay. So essentially what happened is like, I had this like compression injury because they stood up too. I'm bragging, but like I stood up too fast with the weight, the bar popped off my back and then it landed back on my back mm. and then my vertebrae went. <laughs> um, you did that, and, on uh, too, which is the best. You're probably like, fuck, I'm such a tool. I was like, I'm <laughs> fucking sick. I move yeah. so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so essentially what had happened is like, I had had like, this weird like lateral quad tightness for like the entire off season after that. And I didn't really think anything of it. And then I fucking first one blows. Don't think anything of it. Come back rehab. Second one blows on the other side in the exact same spot. And I was like, lightning doesn't fucking strike twice in the same place. Like this is fucking weird. And I went to my AT and like when I had had that compression injury, you have that spiral fascial line. And then that spiral fascial line like crosses over on that kind of like lateral aspect of your quad, exact same spot on both sides. And that's where it tore. It's essentially like, you know, if it was a sausage, the sausage casing just got too tight. And then the muscles like then <laughs> pop through the sausage casing. And so I still have like an identical hole on my vastus lateralis on both sides. That's crazy. That's yeah. It was actually, it's actually, it, was, it wasn't funny though. It, it was kind of funny. Your attitude was really good throughout the whole thing. You're like, I'll be back. Like you're, well, it was, it was just, yeah, I was, it was one of those things where I was like, you know what? Like, 
I like broke my shoulder blade, anteriorly dislocated my shoulder and tore all of my rotator cuff muscles and then played a full season of rugby six weeks later. I'm like, human body's pretty fucking resilient. If I tear a quad, like, cause at first I thought it was a big deal. And then Paul was like, you know, tearing your quads, just like a really bad hamstring pull just on the front of your leg. Right. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, it's the same thing. Like when you pull your hamstring, you're tearing your hamstring. I was like, oh, okay. And then the moment I realized that, I was like, well, I'm fine. I'll be okay. The thing is, is like with the second you do powerlifting, you think it's like, it's over because you can't do it. But like when I was playing football and you probably had this in the military too, but like I fucked up myself real bad. Like, like I've torn my hip and, and, and I'll just, you just play through stuff. You play through stuff that I literally, I would bitch out right now. Like I'd be like, if, if I did something like football injuries, like, yeah, I'm like, I'm done but when you're that young and stupid and like you feel like your life's on the line it's like oh if I get kicked off the team I'm fucked um you figure it out real fast it's just like that's how you know power is not that important well I don't know I don't know if you if the, if, the, if time had caught up with you guys yet but when I was playing football I mean I got hit got a concussion so bad went out threw up on the sideline once I was done throwing up I went back in yeah like we didn't know I was like yeah it's just a concussion <laughs> like the, the the you have like the worst powerlifting injury like the one where like your leg fucks up during like I, I would say a lot of powerlifting injuries are like chronic over time there's yeah. very little acute ones but like once you've dealt with acute injuries it's just like it's not even the same like it's so different <laughs> well it's yeah it's, and it's or like, like impact injuries like those are like it's like oh these powerlifting injuries aren't that bad like yeah, they are well- yeah, well, like, Dave has a ton of experience with impact injuries because he got fucking punched in the face boxing for his whole life. But, like, that made – I'm sure that made powerlifting less scary. Like you said, they're, like, put on a singlet. You're like, what? <laughs> you know who I yeah, am? but at the same time, is there something, especially once you had a back injury, like, it doesn't go away. That's my thing. Because, like, I still wake up, and every day, like, sometimes I bend down to pick up, like, a pencil off the floor. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, this could be the time it goes. Yeah, well, yeah, and and Dave's, like, it's funny, because, like, Dave's back's fucked from being asked to, like, walk all over the Middle East. Yeah. And then my back's fucked from football and then standing up too fast. Um, And it's just, like, when you lack confidence in your spine, like everything else is affected. And you're like, I can't do fucking anything. And then it affects everything downstream. And then like, you know, your hips don't work properly. And then your hips don't work properly. And then like your knees really start to hurt. And you're like, this is, why can't I just have a fucking normal back? (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's like the thing is when you're sitting, you'll sit at your, your computer and work all day and get up and you're fucking like an 80 year old man yet i'll go roll jujitsu and i'm fine like it's like the movement and medicine thing is 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 definitely true in a lot of ways but it's like i'll sit work all day and i'm like fuck i'm crippled for the next three hours i wonder how much of that has to do with monotony like that's um like this like i was i think we were in our chat before but um with jeb but like my knee has been fucked since the end of powerlifting. Anyways, it, it, it like doesn't hurt when I do like other stuff. Like it's so neurological because I think it's the same movements over and over again are like almost worse. Like with football, there's like so much stuff and so much variability that you inadvertently find a different strategy. But when you're only doing the same three fucking things the whole time, there's not much <laughs> other choice on how to do the movements. Yeah, you don't have that much variability at the end of the day. It's like, well, like at some point you still need to go into knee flexion, whether you're internally or externally rotated in the bottom of that knee flexion like you still have to be there and if that's what aggravates you then you just can't fucking do that yeah which the sport just sucks basically like basically fuck powerlifting (laughs) (laughs) one i fucking say that every time i have a hard workout i'm like why the fuck do i do this (laughs) this is the stupidest shit of all time well, the, the problem is, like, the more I get, like, older and now I'm having a kid and stuff, I'm totally turning into one of those people as, like, like who was the person who's, like, powerlifting is so important. And then now I'm, like, fuck powerlifting. <laughs> I, and, Jeb, we're going to have to change the podcast. We're going to have to, like, <laughs> call it fuck powerlifting. Be, like, soft. Be, like, you know what? We're just going to enjoy life and, and activities and be super subpar at all of them and be totally happy. Like, what's that podcast look like? I'm becoming way better at, f- at being subpar at things. Jiu-Jitsu has, has, has done me a big I'm going to find purpose in life, not in, in hobby sports. There's, that, there's like no a purpose thing? in life. 
Is that a, right. like, is there a crowd for that, Stu? Or is it like, is there not? Oh, well, he, well, here's the thing too, is like, the more things it's like, um, the more things that I've added in and like the busier I've gotten, yeah. um, the less, because, so there's this weird psychological phenomenon in powerlifting where it's like, you know, like Dean, I know you've had this and Dave, I know you've had this. I can't speak to you, Jeb. Um, Probably. Whereas like, you'll get stressed about something, right? And you're like, oh, you know, like I got into a fight with the wife or this guy cut me off in traffic or whatever. And you feel like shit and you go into the gym and you're like, if I just bench what I want to bench, I'll feel better. And then you don't bench what you want to bench and you fucking implode. Yeah. And it's like, okay. And it's like, well, why is that happening? Because we put so much of our kind of like psychological energy into performing well at this workout and we've cared so much about this that it's making us fucking miserable and it's like the more things that i've added with like dave and i getting really busy with kodiak and then like me doing all this additional work with prescript and all this other stuff that's kind of come up i don't really give a shit if i have a bad training session anymore and then because of that i have far less bad training sessions and it's like you know like fucking Dean, like you brought up the example of like John Hack, the dude's like crushing pizza and chugging juice and he's the best in the world. Like he doesn't give a fuck if he has a bad training session and because he doesn't care, it's that like lack of care that ultimately affords him the freedom to be really good. Yeah. And like so many people think they have to be all in and it's like, well, not really. <laughs> well, that systemic, yeah. Jeb might be the best to answer this one, but that systemic stress of being psychologically stressed is essentially putting you over the edge i would say long term especially when it's like built up in your head as this thing it's not even that's why i said it's not even real no like you probably well, do better unless you care i know it it's also weird, the but... danger with identity right when, yeah. when our identity is something that's a sport because at some point it's going to get taken away from you or yeah. you're not going to be if, even if you are the best in the world how long are you going to be the best in the world and if that's where your identity is wrapped up you're going to be fucked up and that's why having these other pursuits is, is so beneficial is you, you can put your energy into other things. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a, there was a guy that uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but um, there was Afterwards. a guy that I used to, what's that? Afterwards. Yeah. There was a, there's a guy that I used to compete with. Um, and he was like, honestly, man, like, cause he kind of just like dropped off the fucking radar and he does what, every retired power lifter does and they just started doing brazilian jiu-jitsu um you had a meme and, uh, about that too that was, that? A, that was a good meme yes yeah. meme on instagram it's, it's funny because uh, the guy was bald and he kind of looked like jeff <laughs> <laughs> well it's funny because i was literally like i should do brazilian jiu-jitsu because like i want my daughter to do it and i was like and i still like a power lift thing so i'm like that would be good and now i'm thinking i don't want to be that anyways but he kind of he kind of fell off the map, and I was like, and I asked him about it, and I was like, what do you think happened? And he was like, honestly, man, and he's like, I went to the Arnold's and I did well at the Arnold's, and he's like, and I became obsessed, and so much of my ego became wrapped up in like the instant gratification from others, right? Like if I'd have a big deadlift session, I'd look at my fucking, I'd post it on Instagram, and I'd look at my Instagram, and I'd have forty comments telling me how fucking awesome I was. Yeah. And then I had like, I go to a meet, and I'd have forty fucking people being like, oh my god, you know, I, I wish I could be as strong as you. And he's like, and so much of my ego is tied up in this shit. And he's like, and I was so obsessed with it. And he's like, this guy was like, I don't, I don't know what we're allowed to talk about, and not talk about with regards to like performance enhancing drugs. Talk about, talk about. Yeah. Um, is like, this guy would start his meat prep at three grams of test and 200 milligrams of anadrol. Yeah. That was the start. That's where he started. And it would go up. And he was like, I just became obsessed with more and more and more because in his head, he's like, if I can just take more, then I'll be stronger. And if I can be stronger, then more people will tell me that they want to be me. And then it's going to feed into my ego. And he's like, I, he's like, I almost fucking got divorced. Mm -hmm. My wife was like, all right, you either fucking figure this out or we're done. And he's like, and now like I talked to him in like three years ago, like I couldn't give a fuck about this guy. And like, you know, I had some shit go on recently and like, he randomly added me on Instagram. Like we started talking and stuff and he was like super supportive and nice. And I was like, where the fuck did this guy come from? Like, he's so fucking cool now. <laughs> and it was literally just because like he had divorced his ego from the sport yeah. and now he's just doing it because he enjoys it. 
and he's a way better person to be around, and he's just as strong as he was before. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. Well, that's what people have asked me. They're like, you know, getting into competing in jiu-jitsu, and I'm like, I won't. I was like, because that I would turn jujitsu into the same thing. And right now it's this great release. It's an ego, you know, detachment. It's all this good stuff. If I started competing, I'd be like, I want to win a master's world title. And it would, it would ruin everything that's good about it. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. Cause like you say that and like, I've now have the, like the thing about like football is it gets taken away from you essentially. Like you age up yeah. um, and powerlifting somewhat the same, but it's, it's like it's really hard. It's actually really for me. I can compare both worlds um, to like who I was when I was like thinking I was going to be the best and blah 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 blah. To like where I'm now, I'm like so much happier, which is like a weird spot to be in because I still want to compete. But I'm like, if I do that, I'm gonna be unhappy. I'm, I'm gonna be in a lot of arguments with my wife again and throwing stuff at the wall because I had a bad deadlift session and like I've my belt has made it across my gym at certain points and you're like and then you look back and you're like oh like you had a bad deadlift session like no one even knows what deadlifting is like most like literally 99% of the world doesn't even like they think it's impossible to deadlift without hurting your back and I'm worried about this and you're in your fucking basement at seven o'clock in the morning just whipping your fucking belt yeah it was it was like seven thirty. Yeah, it was about seven thirty. Well, that's why strongman was so good, is because nobody knows what a deadlift is. But if I do car deadlift, people are like, "You're clearly the strongest man in the entire world. You just lifted a car twenty times." <laughs> it's like it's like the military. It's like the, I already assumed Dave is the baddest motherfucker on the podcast. Like Dave would kill all of us in the end of the world situation. You seem like a nice guy, but I feel like there's a switch somewhere. <laughs> And like, like you have a, you already have half the stuff in the background ready to go. Yeah, <laughs> he's building a war wagon back there. Your bug out, yeah. your bug out, John Deere. <laughs> I was expecting to see guns though, so like that's, it's. Well, I guess you can't own automatics anymore in Canada, right? I can't even remember the rule. No, so like those, there's been tons of, um, like rules for I guess what what they would say in the media. It's like military grade shit has been like illegal since the late 70s um so now everything that everyone can buy now is you know it's just a black rifle that looks a certain way but it's the exact same caliber or even smaller in most cases compared to what you can shoot a deer with um so all that kind of stuff is already it's already been off the table and taken away from the civilians for for x amount of years um but it all tight, like getting back to, I, I, I had the same mental struggles, like within, um, within competing in powerlifting where, you know, if I'd have that shit session, like I would fucking be so pissed off and defeated where I wouldn't talk to my wife, you know, I wouldn't be interested in, you know, doing whatever with my son. And it started to take away so much shit. Because coming from the military, like that switch you were talking about, uh, it kind of like that switch also is what validates you within the unit as well. So um, I was talking to Stu about this, where pretty much for the past 10 years that I spent within Seesaw, I kind of put blinders on myself where I'm like, I need to be the fucking hammer at any given point in time. And that's how... I was perceived by my peers. That's how I was perceived by the the whole unit. You know, if there was a fucking door to go into and sort shit out on the other side of it, I would put myself in that fucking position where it's like, this is what I have to do. This is what is expected of me and fucking good to go. Um, But doing that for 10 fucking years, like I've been, not that I'm proud of it, but uh, I've been the same fucking rank since like 2000 and fucking seven which to do you know 12 years especially in a small team environment uh within seesaw you know i i watched most of my peers progress to you know certain like become the sergeant become the platoon warrant and take on more leadership responsibilities within the unit where i kind of neglected that route and i was like well fuck that right like fucking stay tough bro like had that stupidity where it's like it held back so much self-development 
um, and self-improvement and getting onto those leadership positions. Like now I'm at a point where it's like, okay, I've had a family for X amount of years. Like I have vested interest outside of the military. I don't seek validation from having that mindset because that was the only thing that was working for me at the time. If I wasn't doing that, I felt like I'd be nothing, right? Uh, same thing could be said for when you're, you're trying to compete in powerlifting. Like if I don't hit these numbers, I'm never going to be fucking good at it, you know? Um, and tying over into BJJ where it's like, it takes away the fun out of it because you fucking start to put those blinders on yourself where um, like, and this is where we all relate in the same mentality where it's like, you have that switch to be that a type, like, if this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to put all my fucking eggs in this basket. And if it doesn't pan out, it just fucks up everything else in life. Mm -hmm. But you don't see that when you hit that switch, right? Or like, um, even with powerlifters with the fucking ego and the whatever, whatever, I was like, there's a time and place for it for sure. Um, being at that elite level, like if, if you're not at world's fucking strongest man, like you shouldn't, you know, have those blinders put on in place because it's like, you know, there's this level and then there's where you are, where you can still enjoy everything else. You can balance life and be a better person and better performer of your chosen sport and keep everything in balance, you know, until you get to that level. Like I guarantee you all those dudes who have put themselves on the line and, you know, uh, from strongman, like Eddie Hall even brought it up in his documentary or he's like, yeah, I was a fucking shit father. Yeah. You know, and he's sitting there like 420 pounds fucking crying in front of a camera. I was like, well, that's pretty fucking, that's a real situation where it's like, you know, a lot of people, they see, they see the outcome where it's like, holy fuck, if I train hard, put everything else aside, I'm going to get that medal. It's like, okay, well, once you get that fucking medal, you realize all the shit that you've missed and you're never going to get that back. Um, so that's the, cost. Idea. that's the cost that doesn't get talked about. And I like, in, and this is the crazy thing is like that cost doesn't matter for like your Eddie Hall, who Eddie Hall literally won it. So like his costs may have aligned with his benefit. If you look at it from him, cause he actually, he was the top in the world. He got all the sponsorship money that, and even then I'm sure he would take it back. There's, there's this idea of the people that are way lower taking those same costs to get yeah. the benefit. Like yeah. to, to be below average and, not, and that's kind of, it's kind of nice to understand where you sit on that. Cause then at least you can make an evaluation. Is this cost worth it? But I think that a lot of people have the blinders on. They don't even know where they stand on the hierarchy of whatever hobby or sport that they're in and they're doing it's, it's yeah. I don't know. And those are the guys that never fucking make it. Yeah. Cause they lost everything for, for to, to, to be like to squat 600 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> it could be ranked. Yeah. 400 in, the, in, in on the, the level like it's just like that's to me that's crazy but I bet at 27 years old I would have been like yeah done um, I'll, I'll trade it in so I'm glad I've grown up I guess <laughs> so it, it took me like from the age of 17 till I uh, I finished up uh, as a full-time member at the unit until I was about 29 yeah you know and I had a huge fucking like a huge awakening and a huge fucking crash at the same time. Like once I was no longer in that environment, just like anything where it gets taken away from you, like Stu can attest to like, now he's no longer on the team. You know what I mean? It's, it's the same kind of drop off where you've had those X amount of years to build up more than just, you know, this more than just football, more than just uh, this persona of, I need to do this type of job a certain way and fuck everything else. Um, and you know, at the time, like I fucking, like I left my wife, <laughs> it was fucking total shit. And I had those blinders on and it was like that stupid mental loop where I'm like, I have a fucking goal. I need to do everything in order to achieve that. So fuck everything else. And you're, you're such a worse off person for it. Like my performance was shit. Just like you said, it's like, I threw away fucking everything to deadlift 600 pounds at the fucking Kelowna fucking university campus, like in front of 10 people that I didn't even know. Right. And it's just like, okay, cool. 
you know, those same thing goes for those guys that, oh, fuck, I just pulled this deadlift, better put it on Instagram. That dude's going to get fucked up if only five people comment. And then he'll be a fucking a worse off person for it. So I had, like, I had to have this huge fucking crash. Like, everything in life fucking just went to total shit until I was able to, you know, get my bearings back. Thank fuck my wife was like, I know you're stupid. Come home. (laughs) And and life since then, and that was, you know, about two and a half years ago. Life since then, since I was like, okay, I only train four days a week. And it's not my only focus. Sometimes I take my son with me to the gym. And if he's fucking around on whatever, I just, I'll stop what I'm doing. I'll go fuck around with him for a bit, go back, do my deadlift, still get the training in for sure. But those blinders are now off. And now it's, it's opened up so many more opportunities, um, which now has bled into bears and arrows, which has now bled into like Stu's life, getting him involved as a coach um and running kodiak barbell so it's just like i can't it's like stress enough like how much these people just need to like realize there's so much more beyond like this well, sport or that but that's sport, what comes or, full circle to kind of i was gonna say that's what comes full circle to kind of what we we're talking about before like people putting in their time and then like being in these positions that then pass on i feel like the people who have good modeling of, of coaches and they might not realize it at the time, but they can pull from it after they've had the crash. I don't want to say like all the people who've had a crash are going to be your best coaches and do all this stuff, but at least they can pass on how not to fucking do that. Because I, I think that there is some semblance of success that will come from passing that on, as opposed to telling people you should give up everything to, to you know what I mean? And I don't think that message gets passed on enough. So it's, it's kind of, that's why I like this conversation because hopefully someone can listen and be like, oh, damn, I'm that person. I need well, to go the, listen to these people and yeah. figure out my shit. I think the, the most important thing, too, is like having coached Dave for probably three years now, like once Dave allowed his life to open up, like his fucking lifts exploded. Like absolutely over, like, you know, he benched a, uh, we're at the gym on what Tuesday Dave's best competition bench is like 375 and he benched 380 for like almost five close grip Jesus but it's like and that's because like we had a long conversation and I was like listen dude like because him Dave and I are like wired very similarly and it's like listen this is the shit that I've dealt with this is what I found made me feel better so we go in, if we have a bad session, take it as a bad session. Like, you know, the fucking week that Dave and Dave and Kay and Emmett came out from at West, like it was a, it was a, it was a travel week. And I was like, well, why don't we just fucking take a deload this week? Like you're probably not going to be breaking any fucking records. And cause if we can contextualize that and like allow the recovery to get back into play and like allow him to kind of like get his equal footing, boom, hits a massive fucking bench PR. And it's like, just, you know, it's not a, it's not this fucking game that you have to win right now. Just like take your time, slow the fuck down, enjoy the process and realize that there's like, there's more things to your life than just lifting weights. And if lifting weights doesn't go well, rely on the other things in your life that you enjoy. I think that's a, that's a good, see, this is why I brought you guys on. It was a perfect way to like end the whole thing. We got these two power lifter dudes talking about psychology. <laughs> 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 Which is great up Jeb's alley. Je- Jeb's like, fuck, like, Jeb's usually the one who talks about that shit. Jeb, you, you got anything to add to the psychology talk before we wrap it up? No, I mean, I, you know, I just, I think, I think we got the title in there. I think uh, Dave got us on there, like, beyond powerlifting, you know? It's like oh, that. I like that. Like, like what, you know, again, I, I think it's it's a good counterpoint because, you know, the the mythology of powerlifting is like watching West Side where they're like, you know, fucking, you're going to go to prison, you're going to lose your family, you're going to fucking try to kill each other in the gym, and the the thing that you get out of it is your name goes on top of this dry erase board for the next two Maybe. weeks until someone else beats it. Unless you die, or, or like, yeah. you'll get a picture on the wall if you die. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, like... That, that did it for me, I was like... It's, ro- it's romantic, like, honestly, if I was 22 and, and a big lifter, like, I would buy fucking right into that. 
100%. but the cost, you know, the cost benefit just isn't there. Like if I was to tell them anything, I'd be like, listen, when Louie dies, this gym's going down. It's like a shithole. Like your name on the wall is gone now, dude. It's like, fuck. Yeah, someone else is going to fucking rent it and there's no more West Side. So figure it the fuck out now. <laughs> Things I watch, I've been off. watching this. There's this Amazon documentary about the Grateful Dead that I've been watching. And one of the things they said is that, um, you know, they think about this like classic Greek or Roman mythology that, you know, our name lives on in history. And it said in a thousand years, no one's going to know your name. No one's going to know what you did. So you better fucking take advantage of right now because this idea of being mythologized in history is bullshit. And I was like, fuck, for a bunch of guys that did acid for like 20 years straight, that's well, it actually makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't learn all that stuff without taking acid, dude. That's fair. It helps. Put that on the program. Take, <laughs> you know what? You're a little too stressed out. I want you to take a, a what they call a heroic dose of acid or mushrooms and like have a question you want to answer. Here, here's the question you need to answer. Is there more life than powerlifting? <laughs> Put that in your head. Take 10 grams of mushrooms and... And see how that night turns out and then you go bench next week that's <laughs> that's the program i don't I, it's probably like 15 grams of mushrooms I was, i'll put it on i'll put it on the website you can sign up today the heroic <laughs> beyond, beyond, beyond powerlifting what? program we're gonna like <laughs> literally flip your fucking switch that sw- that switch that you want to turn on you we're turning it off yeah, with ego death total yeah. ego death <laughs> <laughs> like literally have a structure like five questions you need them to ask like we'll yeah. do Zoom call if you need. Just take the mushrooms. And here's the questions we're gonna ask. That's how they do it, right? I've I've read and seen some documentaries. It's like you're gonna be the sh- the Sherpas to like um, literally turning their ego switch off about powerlifting. And then when they're like super high, you're gonna be like, like they're gonna be, like, oh my god, I'm trying to ask you like powerlifting means nothing. It's not even a sport. And they just <laughs> totally fuck with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're six Holy on the lip sucks. And they're like, no. <laughs> oh, All sorry. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> with, let's, where, do, where, do, where, do, where does everyone find you guys? Or like kind of, they want to kind of get signed up with what you guys going on. I, I, we'll start with Stu and then and we can do Dave. Yeah. So you can find me personally on Instagram at LaQuadzilla. Um, Dave and I's coaching account is Kodiak Barbell. Uh, Dave, it's your turn. Yeah, so we got uh, Bears and Arrows Co. on social media, along with uh, bearsandarrows.com for the website, as well as kodiakbarbell.com for the, the programming thing. And uh, yeah, there's a contact page either on the website or you can DM us directly on social media. And yeah, Bears we'll get back and get you. If, um, if you do do that heroic dose program, like I want some credit at least. All right, deal. I think, I think it could fired by Dean. Yeah, I think it could work. I'm not doing it, but um, cool guys. Thanks for coming out. I'll uh, Jimmy, anything to say? Uh, no, this is awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, appreciate the time. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I don't tussle with a whale. I don't handcuff lightning, throw thunder in jail. You can't stop me. I'm going to win. It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit. And keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. I won't quit. I just keep getting stronger. 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 Stronger.